what happens if they try to actually imprison the president elect? Okay, so if I'm on their team, this is a great question because we I've had this I had this conversation with a couple of you know really very good people who are very analytical and they think about scenarios and scenario development. You know, if they do this, so let's so let's just assume that Marshawn says, "Nope, you're getting in my court." Sentences him twenty five years. Okay, you're going to prison right now. In fact, I gave you a I gave you time to get your your affairs in order. You're going to prison and you're going to actually go down into the prison of the, of the courthouse that he's in. Cause they got a prison right down yeah. there. And then we're going to move you over to, to you are going to remand you to, to the department of justice over to Rikers, let's say. Right. So if that happens, you're going to see a, like, like, you know, like a wilding going on in the media where it's like, we can't have a convicted felon in prison, you know, in the white house. This is where people like Jamie Raskin out of Maryland, Congressman Raskin out of Maryland, Who's already said we're not going to let this guy serve? And 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 uh, and he said it was at uh, uh, a, it was a bookstore panel discussion in February of this year that if Trump wins, they will refuse to certify on the grounds he is ineligible under the Fourteenth Amendment. Those are his words. Yeah. I'm paraphrasing, but that's what he said. Yeah, that's right. And and I mean, so give they you know to give them more fuel for that argument, right? And to allow the the woke corporate media. To uh, to to kind of dominate that narrative, to allow all these people that are in the sort of the globalist uh, cabal, if you will, um, to say, well, how can we have a guy that's sitting in prison, a convicted felon, you know, blah 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 blah, right? Well, one of the things and that I do believe, and this is this is something that I don't think that they can overcome this because, and you're a perfect example of it. Okay, you're a, you you are a perfect example of it because of your great interview uh, with Trump, as well as other podcasters. I. I, I'm sort of coining this presidency as the podcast presidency because this is the death of of the woke corporate media. They're there. Nobody watches them anyways. I, you know, unless you're like my age or older and you still kind of go at home and you turn your little tube on. Right. But um, or you, you you flip to some cable news or ABC or CNN or you still watch 60 minutes. That's it. I mean, those that, that is a dying it's like a, it's like an animal on the road that's been hit, you know, and, and backed over. So this, this presidency proved the, the durability and the reliability of citizen journalism and the sort of what I, what I call the podcast presidency, because Trump realized that he realized that I, I forget the time frame when you guys did, it was a little while back. It was other, it was the libertarian convention. Yeah. Right before he yeah. spoke, he actually was late to his speech for us and i am i'm very grateful it was an honor that he he took the time yeah so i mean it was a it was a a while ago but about six months prior to the election i think trump you know whether it was him or whether he saw something you know maybe he watched you know the tucker interview with putin where we learned joe biden hasn't spoken to a a a nation a a nation state leader who has more nuclear weapons than we do and there's a war going on and everybody's talking about using nuclear weapons and biden hasn't spoken to him in two years (laughs) I mean, that's insane. So that that interview, maybe Trump watched something like that. Maybe, he, you know, he knows Joe Rogan, you know, so on and so forth. All of a sudden you start seeing Donald J. Trump doing these podcasts. Yeah. And I'm like, OK, he gets it. He's starting I, to get it. He got I the think whole shift. if go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that, um, you know, going to your D-Day uh, plus analogy, one. Right. Because really it was a four year journey to get here. And so mm-hmm. with Democrats are sitting there going, how? How is this possible? It's like you guys don't understand what you've done. This is retribution because right. what what the establishment did by going after Trump and then turning that into the COVID pandemic, going after all of us, right? And what the Democrats did, particularly going after businesses, going after you know, going after these crazy mandates, going after the vaccine mandates, it created so much resentment, right? That this is all the consequence of four years of that. Plus the censorship, as you're talking about, is all the con- you know all the censorship did was it built Rogan even bigger, right? It oh, yeah. built all the podcasts Everybody. bigger. So it, really what they did is actually they sowed the seeds of their own demise. And so now we're reaping it. And that's that's why I feel like what you're saying is to a certain extent true. But whatever it would see, it's like everything that they're going to do is only going to backfire now because we have so much more power amongst the people. There's a realization of our power. There's a realization that, hey, you shut down us on, you shut us down on YouTube, we're going to start new channels. We're going to start mm-hmm. Rumble. You're going to cancel us, we're going we're gonna to gather together and create something new. I think we realize now that we can build 
even if they took it away from us, we would build our republic without them. That's, but that's what we have. It's as you were saying, General Flynn, that a, a wounded animal is dangerous. And so the question then becomes, yeah. to what degree are they willing to sacrifice, sabotage, or burn it all down? I think that if Trump decides to play this game and show up for court on the 26th, I don't know if, if let's say Mershon says, no, I'm not going to throw this out. You are convicted and you are going to come in for sentencing. If Trump goes into that prison, he will never come out. And I, and, and whatever form that takes, mm-hmm. I'll just keep it simple and say, he's not making it to January. He's no. not, he's not going to make it to the white house. Yeah. And that's a really, so that's a scenario. Okay. So for those of us that look at these kinds of, you know, security issues at this level, um, you have to play these things out. And you have to look at the second, third, fourth, fifth order effects. You've got to look at the consequences. You've got to look at the players, and you've got to examine, you know, what what are their what are their intentions. And this is where you know, like good intelligence, bulletproof intelligence helps. Insiders help. Whistleblowers help. Uh, people getting people into the camps. I mean, I guarantee, I I, I guarantee, you know, one hundred percent that there are people in the Trump camp that have been working for the other side damn near the whole time. Now, whether or not, you know, you can, you can judge them for how well they did or didn't do, but, uh, and now that's going to be again. And so what happens is immediately, you know, elements of government start to come together to try to go, okay, well, we're here to help, right? People in the government. And, you know, it's like I told one Congressman who ran, this is back in the 2022 uh, election victory. He, uh, we, I uh, supported him. And uh, we went and helped him raise some money, and he won. And I saw him at an event, and this was before he went into Congress. And it was like at a, it was, I think it may have been at Mar-a-Lago or it may have been some other place, but we, it was at an, an event prior to him actually taking the job. First time congressman, America first guy. And I said to him, uh, when he came over to me, he goes, hey, I want to thank you very much. And I said, do me a favor. The first person that comes to speak to you when you, when you show up to Washington, D.C., I want you to remember who he is or she is, and I want you to understand that that's your enemy. That's wow. the first person that you cannot trust. It's a very Godfather-esque moment. <laughs> and, well, and it's and it's very true because people that go to D.C. and try and back to back to something we had you know, we talked about earlier, you know, like and I said, and I actually said this in a film, Trump didn't know the ways of Washington D.C. He he accepted that people in the Republican Party were going to. Give them good people, right? And give them the right people. I mean, Dan Coates, the first. Still talking about Trump being us, uh, you know, under under the thumbprint of uh, of Putin <laughs> just two days ago. So this is a guy that was handed to him to be the director of national intelligence the entire time. And I learned this from uh, from Devin Nunez, okay, in, in the filming of our of our movie. And 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 I and I know that we're going to find out a lot more stuff here because because you know they're 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 going to look into it. And we talked about cash, you know, earlier. So. The entire time he's there, and frankly, Mike Pompeo, who I'm not a fan of, and that's you know neither here nor there, but I'll say it, um, who was his CIA director, the entire time they had the full, firm, bulletproof evidence that said the whole Russia, you know, nonsense was nonsense, was a hoax, a full, the entire time, yet said nothing, and they allowed the country, they allowed Trump, they allowed people's and their families to be destroyed. They allowed Trump and his presidency to be attacked, and they just sat there and said nothing. Thanks for watching this clip from the Culture War podcast. We're live every Friday, 10 a.m. to noon, so subscribe and come hang out.